It is in one of the driest places on the planet, in the middle of the Atacama Desert in Chile, that one of the most important projects of the decade has just begun. Here, in this inhospitable place, man will build the largest terrestrial telescope in the world. The ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, is a giant machine worth more than 1 billion euros that will pierce the sky like never before. The European Southern Observatory, which brings together some 15 European countries, is the originator of this mammoth project. And it was Pascal Lepère, the French manager of this extraordinary project, who decided for the first time to open its doors to us. Where did you see some wires? Uh, when we were through the road. Ah, OK. Here we're building what will be the largest telescope in the world. Its primary mirror will be 39.5 meters long, and we are here at the edge of the dome foundation. And this dome will be 96 meters in diameter and 85 meters high. To see far, you have to think big. This is the motto of astronomers. The ELT will therefore be the largest of all. Imagine, you could fit two Arc de Triomphes in this dome. With its 39-meter diameter primary mirror, the ELT should multiply by five all our knowledge of our universe. Its revolutionary optical design is based on a principal mirror composed of 798 hexagonal segments, the first of which was successfully cast in Mainz, not far from Frankfurt in Germany. five-mirror system with integrated atmospheric turbulence processing will provide images of exceptional quality, as if the telescope was operating from space. Installed on Cerro Amazones, a mountain at an altitude of 3,046 meters, the ELT is expected to make its first observations in 2024. We needed a certain area to install the ELT, so we cut into the mountain at about 80 meters in height until we reached the size of a plateau large enough to install a telescope and all the related equipment. It's a construction site in extreme conditions. We're all working in the extreme. It's a huge step for the scientists in what they can expect from, from such a new telescope. The sensitivity, the resolution, or the, the sharpness of the images, all of this bring a lot of, of the unexpected things which they do not even dream of today. How the universe functions still holds many secrets. Black holes, the nature of the cosmos and the Big Bang the ELT will tackle the greatest scientific challenges of our time, including the search for planets similar to the Earth, and those orbiting in the habitable zone of stars other than the Sun, an area where life could exist, one of the holy grails of modern astronomy. So if we, for example, would discover oxygen, uh, ozone, chlorophyll, exciting things, methane, in the atmosphere of this uh, planet, it's very exciting, not only for scientists, I think everybody who hears about that gets excited about this idea that we could really observe another planet which um, uh, contains signatures of, of life, for example. While waiting for the commissioning of this extraordinary telescope, it is only a few kilometers from the ELT site that the European Southern Observatory operates the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. At an altitude of 2,500 meters on Cerro Paranal, this observatory with its four immense telescopes has the most powerful optical system in the world, designed to explore distant galaxies and the far reaches of the universe. Thank you. 
It was the VLT that made it possible to discover the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and which also found some of the oldest stars in our universe. And more recently, it was this telescope that managed to take the first picture of an exoplanet, a planet outside our solar system. The image that people sometimes have is of the astronomer in his tower with his eye to the lens. That's an image that is pretty, but it's an image that has completely vanished. These days, this work is a team effort. Each year, about 2,000 applications are submitted to use the ESO telescopes, which would require four to six times more nights than is currently available. And at more than 50,000 euros per night of observation, the VLT must be operational every night. An incredible mechanism, which requires a lot of maintenance and supervision. The complete daily checkup of this telescope takes about 30 minutes. When you arrive, it's really impressive, but now I'm used to it. I know it very well. I know all its noises. I know its behavior, the time it takes to open up. It's a toy, but an expensive one. It's the rendezvous. It's something that's been going on since the beginning of Paranal. In the time I've been working here, it's always been the time when everyone gets together to come and see the sunset. It's a special, magical place. It's true that one of the pleasures for many of us is not only to come at sunset, but also to leave the telescopes for a little bit and come and see the sky outside, just with the naked eye, because it is a show that is unlike any other. Less than a minute was enough for the sun to disappear below the horizon. Then began what scientists call the astronomical twilight. The first stars appear slowly, while the domes open one after the other. It is at this precise moment that the telescopes pass into the hands of the operators. In the VLT's control room, everyone is at their post for a long night of observation. It has now been more than two years since Frederick, a Swiss national, joined the permanent teams of the European Southern Observatory. It's an extremely complex machine with many cogs, many things that must work together that must work in harmony. It's kind of like a spaceship. Like a spaceship, yes. I've never been on a spaceship, so I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's true that once in a while, it strikes me. I'm 32 years old and I'm at the controls of an 8-meter telescope that's really at the forefront of modern astronomy. But then I have to keep working, so I forget. But it's true that once in a while, it makes me really wonder. A telescope with its mirror is only a light collector. It is the instruments that are connected to it which will allow, each in its own way, to measure the properties of this collected light. Some are simple images who take pictures of the sky in different wavelengths. Others, like MUSE, are highly sophisticated spectrographs that decompose the light emitted by the observed object to obtain its chemical composition. 16, 15, 15, 16. Ah. 15, oh, 16. Ah, yeah, okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's very faint. Okay, good, good, good. 
For my part, I would like to observe this part of the galaxy with Muse. And when you process it with software, you can reproduce the image on the sky. So this is the field of view that Muse sees on the sky. And here we see a part of the galaxy that we have observed. What I can do is choose other colors, other wavelengths. By choosing the color, I have physical information that is different. And that, in fact, is how we manage to do physics, astrophysics, not just astronomy where we take images that are interesting, that are important. But here we do astrophysics. The instruments are now really complex, and to see only the raw images coming out of the telescope is impossible to interpret directly. To transform images taken by a telescope into photographs for the general public, scientists must produce what is called a composite image, a superposition where the choice of colors is left free to the appreciation of each astronomer. However, a convention combines certain colors with certain chemical elements. Helium, nitrogen and oxygen are represented more in blue or green, while hydrogen is often red. And so each new generation of instruments allows us to open up a potential for discovery that is extremely wide and that allows us to either look further or look in more detail and therefore effectively learn more about our universe more precisely. Between friendly competition and scientific collaboration, modern astronomy tries to operate various instruments and telescopes together, all focused on the same research. And one of the most important astronomical quests of the moment is to find new exoplanets, those planets that revolve around stars other than our Sun. Since the discovery of the very first one, called 51 Pegasi B, by Michel Mayor and Didier Kellos in the Saint-Michel Observatory in France, proof has been given that there are worlds other than ours, that our solar system is not unique. A monumental discovery that will launch a real world race to research and study these new planets. Using all the possibilities of the VLT, astronomer Pedro Figuera is one of these new exoplanet hunters. The detection of extrasolar planets and the detection of planets similar to our own is an important first step to understand life in the universe. There are many questions to which we do not know the answer. We do not know if life um, arises naturally, where it should appear, how it should appear. But the first step is to try to understand if our planet is common or not. And that's what we are trying to do now is something that is very profound to us as human beings, more than as astronomers. Hunting for exoplanets is a real challenge because these extrasolar worlds are very difficult to detect. They hide in the shadows, made almost invisible by the crushing brightness of their star. Using several methods, astronomers have already managed to find no less than 4,000 of them out of a possible hundreds of billions. A good start, especially since the latest exoplanets discovered have revealed an unexpected diversity by their sizes, orbits and positions. But the one that everyone dreams of discovering would be a cousin of the Earth, or even super-Earths, capable of sheltering life, capable of welcoming it, or even one day of being habitable by man. It must still be possible to reach them though, because for the moment, the nearest one is still located four light years away, or 40,000 billion kilometers. In astronomy, the scale of us versus the universe, of our own experience versus the universe, is overwhelming. It is something that is very hard for us to perceive still as astronomers, because we are human, because after a certain point, we cannot have a different feeling of one billion versus one trillion of stars. But it's still very interesting because it can captivate our imagination. And that's 
where we are in the universe. This, even this recklessness, when we talk about the distance of exoplanets and how completely inaccessible they are to us within our life, our answer is basically, we don't care. We try anyway. And uh, there is this excitement. There is this drive that we want to go forward. Sometimes we are compared to explorers, adventurers. A new day dawns on the Atacama Desert and its immense rocky expanses. An ochre and stony landscape that gives the impression of exploring another planet. Further north, clinging to the Andes mountain range, the ESO operates a second site dedicated to observing the universe. Located at an altitude of 5,200 meters on the Chajnantor Plateau, the site of the ALMA radio telescope is the most extreme astronomical installation of all. It's a very unique instrument, which collects data 24 hours a day, and has made possible numerous discoveries about our origins. Given the altitude, the operation at Observation Center is not located near the antennae, but 2,000 meters below them. Radio astronomy is another way of observing the sky and allows you to see things that an optical telescope cannot see. ALMA can see in both millimeter and sub-millimeter wavelengths, waves that fall between infrared and radio waves. You normally look and you look around to see what's, what's the universe made of. And then sometimes, the older you get, the more experience you get, sometimes you don't need the eyes to actually know that, okay, I'm grabbing a mouse, I'm grabbing a pen, right? You don't need to, to see a dog because you know that it's a dog barking. The same way the astronomers realize that sometimes you don't need the optical, you need something in the infrared to actually probe deeper in regions that are um, too, too embedded in dust. So normally I, I compare this, I compare ALMA with our own uh, audition. So if you want to compare with yourself, here they are, okay? <laughs> you have two antennas, okay? It was a big jump from before and after uh, Alma started observing the sky. Yeah. Every week we have a result from Alma that you go, wow, we can do that. <laughs> One of Alma's capabilities is to detect chemical molecules in the vast clouds of gas and dust where stars and planets are born. Detecting them allows us to know when certain molecules have found the optimal conditions to meet, associate, and give birth to life. In ALMA, as in all the observatories of the world, astronomy is only the last link in a great chain of knowledge and understanding. For one person who observes, there are dozens of others working behind the scenes. Caroline, a young French engineer, is responsible with her team for part of the maintenance on the antennae of the ALMA radio telescope. To get to the antennae, you have to have oxygen bottles. The conditions are really very difficult. We realize that very quickly when we arrive at altitude, and for safety reasons, it is necessary. Ready? We're ready to go up. Do you have all your safety equipment with you? Yeah, from the shoes. Okay, good, good. We are ready.
ALMA is composed of a network of 66 giant antennae that can be positioned in different configurations to observe distinct parts of the sky. In its widest configuration, ALMA acts like one large telescope with a diameter of 16 kilometers. This is called an interferometer. New technologies had to be invented to build ALMA, such as the huge transporters which move the antennae according to the observation programs. On the right, right? ALMA is installed in one of the most extreme places on the planet. Yesterday we had a snowstorm and today we have to check all the antennae, check that there is no snow that has entered the mechanism, because they rotate in this direction and like this, in order to follow galaxies or other astronomers' observations. We are in a really incredible environment with all the volcanoes, the plateau. You can see for hundreds of kilometers, it's incredible. At the very top of the Andes Cordillera on the Chajnantor Plateau, we feel a little like we're on the top of the world, still on Earth, but already closer to the stars. <laughs> 